Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So um, again, you know, very happy to be here today to let you know the goings on for the Weed IPM Lab, and and I absolutely want to acknowledge Katie Gantz, who's uh, who really carries the the young woman's load on getting a lot of this work done. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about, I mean, new, new plantings are are key to keeping growers in business as they're trying to renovate bogs. So we've had several initiatives that have been going on and. We're, we like to try to do long-term projects. So here we're, we're reporting on um, a four-year, basically a four to five-year study where we looked at either newly planted beds or one-year-old beds and looked at various combinations of using either Devernal or, and or Callisto just to try to develop a, a use pattern recommendation for growers because they're always wondering, you know, what should I spray? How many times should I spray? And so we went through 10 different treatments on several different bogs over you know multiple years <clears throat> and basically we were able to the bottom line is that it turns out that if you really have to watch your costs that you can just do one post-emergence Callisto application and it should do pretty well but the best option would be to take advantage of the complementary effects of the Devernal which is pre-emergence with the Callisto and it's still pretty cost effective but a, really just doing one application of each did very well at like mid-range rates. And so we were, you know, able to offer that up and it has become part of our chart book recommendation. Um, another uh, thing that we we're successful in is getting a special local needs label for chemigating intensity, which is a grass herbicide. <laughs> Poverty grass has been a, a significant problem for cranberry growers and they've been really, you know, calling us a lot on how to control it. And the thing is, is that, you know, to be able to chemigate, you can cover a lot of acreage quickly and, and time is money right now. So to be able to um, get this labeling was really important. We were only able to get it for the generic, which is called Intensity or Intensity One, the, the first brand name product select. Um, the, that company was not willing to work with us. So, you know, part of the education that we end up doing for growers is to let them know exactly which products can be used in the specific ways. And we had one grower who went out and treated like 700 acres with uh, chemigating this product and was thrilled with the results. I am a believer. I okay, believer. and Peter I is believe. a believer, so. Um, so against poverty grass? Against poverty yeah. grass. So, um, you know, this is just, you know, one, I think, a, a great example of growers come to us, say, you know, we've got this problem, you know, we get the funds, we get the support from the growers, from the industry, to be able to have concentrated effort to do screening, to do efficacy, and then to be able to deliver a tool. Um, part of the other work that's been ongoing that's been supported by the industry has been screening uh, for new herbicides. Each year, Katie and I go to our Northeastern Regional Weed Science uh, meeting where we hear about you know some of the new compounds that are being <coughs> introduced for turf or corn or soybeans or something and we, we come and you know kind of load up our shelves and then try it try it out um, on the plants that we have and we look at crop safety and then we go and offer those up as candidates to get into the IR4 queue uh, to be able to get residue and ultimately, you know, it may take us 25 compounds we look at and we hopefully get one or two that actually end up being coming tools for the cranberry growers. Um, we are excited, um, keeping our fingers crossed, that in the first or second quarter of next year we will get, receive our full registration for CUR, which is pronamide. It's another pre-emergence herbicide effective against dotter and other pre, uh, perennial grasses. Uh, this is a new formulation, so we didn't have a lot of experience with it. What we had used before was like a wettable powder or a pouch for. This is a, um, a soluble concentrate, so we wanted to demonstrate crop safety with this. And again, this was some work that was supported by the grower uh, industry fund. As I had mentioned in the granting part of the experiment, of the uh, presentation, we were successful in getting a SARE grant for professional development about resistance management. And this is something that cuts across all of our disciplines for entomology, plant pathology, and weed science. And the primary purpose of this project was to unify the kind of education that we deliver to growers. So this was targeting extension educators 
that end up giving educational programs to growers to make sure that we're giving the same message. And so what we did is that we developed a PowerPoint slide presentation that <coughs> extension educators could then use as, as a core and then just adapt it to whatever their specific co uh, commodity was. And then uh, between Marty and Katie, they also did a video. So you can just go onto YouTube and watch an educational video about what resistance management is and how it might apply to your farm. Uh, let's see, we've been working with a farmer as part of the extension implementation program, which is the federal monies that I spoke about earlier. Uh, he is running an organic cranberry farm and does a lot of other, you know, awesome community outreach, uh, working with uh, kids that are challenged in, in either physical or mental ways. And he has a horse farm and he's also using the cranberry farm to try to get them out uh, to do some, you know, good therapy for them. And we've been working with him to try to help him uh, with his cranberry issues. Uh, some of the other work as part of our hatch project was to look at in the springtime when cranberries are coming out of dormancy you can always see that some are coloring up earlier than others and there's always seems to be these patches of what we call mongrel vines and so we were we worked with um, a guy out of the engineering department from UMass Amherst and he was flying his drone over and so we have some good aerial pictures of where those spots were and then we went through and were ground truthing to see if we can try to figure out are there yield differences going on uh, with some of these off types. And of, of course they seem to be much more prevalent with the early blacks in the house. We had, you know, Crystal was trying, was having a really hard time trying to find these off types with Stevens and some of the hybrids. They're just not as visually apparent. Uh, but there's some interest and some work going on in Wisconsin that we're going to try to potentially collaborate with to see if we can work on ways of identifying the plant stress either with infrared or other um, other cameras and with the drones to try to see if we can figure out where these off types are occurring. And knowing where these off types is, is very important because they tend to be much more vigorous and vegetative and so they cut down yield. So we really want to try to maintain as much of the genetic purity of these new plantings as we can. It's an, it's an incredible investment. Uh, from the financial point of view, especially with getting these New Jersey varieties. So you want to try to keep them true to type as long as you can. Uh, I put in some uh, metrics. We use ScholarWorks quite a lot to uh, as, a, as a resource, and it always amazes me how much people use that. Uh, that's where we kind of put a lot of our great literature and our presentations, things that don't quite rise to the snuff of being a referee publication, but are still important uh, information that comes out of our efforts. And, you know, we look at things like BMPs, you know, uh, you know, like 600, almost 700 copies of BMPs were downloaded from folks. And it's been very interesting that we, you can actually look at the country of origin of where these downloads come from. And in the past, China was never even on the radar screen. In the past two years, they've, they've been number one out of some of the downloads of some of our products. Really? So it's really kind of interesting. Yeah, the, the Chinese are getting very interested. And maybe that right. bodes well. We'll go to China. For uh, <laughs> some of our products. <laughs> go false there. Blossom. No, me. That's false right. Blossom. And let's see. Um, oh, and we also we had a summer intern that we spot that we had here. It was actually her second year. It was part of the cafe summer uh, scholar program. We were fortunate in getting a scholarship to support um, Mika Demos, who came and worked in our in our lab and got some great experience. And we really enjoyed having her. And you know a few other ancillary things, but I think that's kind of highlights. And thank you.